want to enjoy the benefits and conveniences of a car, but don't want to pay the price of owning one? Well, with more than 4,600 cars in thousands of different locations across the country, car sharing is an option. The typical car owner in Singapore will spend around 2,000 Singapore dollars a month on their cars. Now, we took the average cost of a car, like an entry-level Toyota Altis, added in the COE, Certificate of Entitlement, the insurance, the parking, the ERP, electronic road pricing, road tax, maintenance, and of course, fuel. But what if that cost can be reduced by switching to car sharing? In this episode of Talking Point, I'm going to be car sharing for seven days, weekend included, to find out if it's worth my time and money. Being a car sharing novice, I'm getting some help from Joel Cole. He's got a car sharing services cheat sheet. So I'm about to start this experiment where we try out car sharing, you know, for one whole week. How do you think I should approach this? So let's look at the car sharing scene in Singapore. There are a few like major players. The main difference is the model that they use in terms of returning a car. Okay. So most of the providers, they actually use this point A to point A model. So from the same place I pick it up, I return it? Exact same space yes, as well? Yes, yes. Okay. it's good for running errands and all that kind of stuff. Right. Alternatively, there's Blue SG. They're the only one with a point A to point B model. So you pick up the car at point A and return it to any Blue SG stations located around the country. So it's better for mean? commute. So Steve, you want to find a car sharing provider, right? So based on where you live, I've identified that Blue SG, Get Go, Tribe Car and Chariot, they're actually okay. about like 1.7 km away for a place. That's quite a bit of a walk. Like, it's like about five bus stops away. So if you walk, it will take about like 25 minutes. One way. Yeah. <laughs> so I like to know a bit more about your driving habits. So the weekdays basically to work, I tend to go from point A to B to C to D to E all in one day. Yeah, so if that's the case, then perhaps you could try the, the point A to A system. Yeah. Where you can book it and book it for longer. It'll be more economical to, to do that. Just know that you have to return to the rental location. So to help you calculate the cost, mm -hmm. I came up with this comparison scenario. Because some of these companies charge by distance travel, Joel based his calculations upon a mileage charge of 45 kilometers in three hours. Tribe Car was the cheapest at $15.70 on a weekday and $23.80 on a weekend. So maybe if you need like so an alternative, let's say track car maybe you can't find a car, you can okay, get okay. go. So. How do I ensure that I always get a car when I need it? So the first thing you can do is to actually book earlier. Anything else I should be looking out for? You have to pay for your own parking. Ah, except Blue SG, except Blue right? SG, yes, yes. So I gotta bring my cash card as well. Yeah. For ERP and whatever, right? Fees. And thing you need to consider is the late charges. So when you oh, make the booking, mm. we always ensure that you are you are doing like have a bit more like time and leeway. Okay, okay. Like 15 or 20, 15 minutes more. Because the late fees are, whoa, steep, man. $24 yeah. for 15 minutes. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Companies like Chariot and Tribe Car also require a deposit of at least 100 Singapore dollars, but will refund the money upon closure of the payee's account. I mostly travel for work, usually hitting several locations in one day. So Joel has recommended that I use an A to A service, means I'll pick up and return the car to the same spot. And he's recommended that I use Tribe Car and Get Go. So I'm going to sign up for both. But that night, when I checked on my Get Go booking... Oh, wait a minute. It says your account has not been activated. Driver's license is less than a year Oh, What? <laughs> that can't be right. That was one company. Let's try another one. Tribe Car. Okay. They've got a car. Ooh, but this is further away. This is like a 15 minute drive. I know the place, but that means it's like a, like a 30 minute bus ride. Oh boy. Okay, but I have no choice. Here we are, this is my car. I mean, looks all right on the outside. It's not super clean. You can see quite a lot of dust and dirt lying around, marks. I'm going to give it a wipe before I touch anything. 
Ooh, pretty black. I mean, we know there's no way a car like this is gonna be super clean, so this is okay, I guess. So I cleaned up the car, about take off, and then I realized, ah, oh, dreads, a few tanks just at that one quarter mark which means I will need to top up the uh, tank. Just uh, been to the petrol station to fill up the tank because I had less than a quarter and as a result, I think I get rewarded with a bit of free time for, I guess, uh, putting in the effort to help them, you know, gas up the car. Not bad. Car sharing companies encourage their users to fill up the car when the fuel gauge falls beneath the quarter mark. The petrol is fully paid for by the company either buy a fuel card in the car, or they will reimburse you if there's a valid receipt. GetGo rewards you with promo codes of varying amounts depending on how full the tank is, while TribeCar gives you the last hour of your booking for free. That explains why I got my last hour of rental free. But as I'm about to find out, car sharing may not be as smooth sailing as it's made out to be. My only qualm is that it smells of smoke, so I think the previous driver was a smoker, and I don't like that. That makes me feel real nauseous. Okay, just looking at my uh, schedule for tomorrow's shoot, Looks like I gotta be somewhere at 10 a.m. Let's see if I can reserve a car tonight because booking ahead of time is the best way to ensure that you have a car when you need it. It's been a few days of car sharing and on most trips, I found myself beginning with a wipe down of the driver's area. The dashboard's a bit dusty. Uh, I mean, these are parts that I guess you normally wouldn't come into contact with, so... I think that's good enough for now. I'm gonna, not going to spend too much time because I'm paying for every minute that I'm cleaning. So I'm paying them to clean their car. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> I want to know if fellow car sharing users have the same pet peeve. Well, they say that sharing is caring. But what about car sharing? Did it leave you swearing? Yep, talking about, you know, dirty cars, dense scratches, almost empty fuel tanks. If you've experienced it before, I want to hear about it. And true enough, all the top complaints had to do with cleanliness. Ooh, roaches running around on the car floor. Ooh, even more icky stuff like animal fur on the seats. Oh boy, this is totally gross. A condom! Yikes! On average, each shared car goes through more than 20 users per month. It's no wonder they can get a little grimy. What does it take to keep these cars clean? To find out, I've got to get my hands dirty. I'm joining GetGo's cleaning crew. GetGo has a cleaning squad of 30 people. One worker is usually allocated per car but newbies like me have to be paired with someone experienced. This car took us just 10 minutes to scrub down and sanitize. So it's pretty thorough. So on the interior, like what you're using now, yeah. it's actually a spray that actually helps disinfect the vehicles. It lasts up to 60 days to keep the car safe and clean. Oh, it's one of those that keeps a layer, supposed to prevent the virus from spreading. And yep. I spent quite a few days uh, using the car sharing services and I know you guys have quite a large cleaning crew, but why are the cars still so dirty? We really depend on customers to also look after the vehicles. So for example, you know, if you were to take the vehicle before me and you were to dirty the vehicle, it's impossible for us to come in between your booking and my booking to look after the vehicle. With 2,000 vehicles on our fleet, we can't be cleaning after every booking. How often do you guys clean these cars? We actually clean them on a, a usage basis. Okay. So depending on how many people use the cars, we will clean them accordingly. It can be as soon as a week or sometimes even two weeks. Yeah. And what's the worst you've seen in terms of the most like disgusting thing you've seen left behind the car? I have some photos that I can oh, share really? with you. Okay. Yep. So this is an example of somebody leaving behind pet fur. Okay. Yeah, this is mud and this is food stuff, attracts cockroaches. But you allow animals in these cars, right? We do as long as they are in carriers. So if people are so inconsiderate, why not impose harsher penalties? It's a good deterrent, yeah. but ultimately it's about the mindset behind it. And in fact, on get goes end, we do ban users who are actively, you know, dirtying our vehicles. So we remove them from our platform. But how do you know it's, it's really them? 
So, you know, when you pick up a car, you're actually rating its cleanliness. The back end, we do have certain patterns that we are observing and, yeah. you know, if you have many strikes against yourself, it right. will trigger an investigation. Yeah, so how do you know which cars to clean and when? Why don't we head back to our office? Sure. Let me show you how it's done. Oh, you mean like right now? Yeah, oh, right okay, now. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Let me finish up this spot. There we go. Welcome to our command centre, Steve. Okay. So on the left, you can see where all our vehicles are across the island. And on our main screen, you can see our operator management system. When you see the word maintenance, it usually means a car is scheduled for cleaning. Every day, the command centre flags up these cars, as well as cars that the user pool has reported to be dirty. Preventive is scheduled tasks, those okay. weekly servicings that we have, as well as reactive where we get feedback from the ground. So this is where we are notified and we will task our operations team to go down to the vehicles. Okay, so I imagine the reactive ones are the more urgent... That's right. So the car is driving well enough. The only uh, slightly concerning bit is uh, in the indicator there, the dashboard, there's a sort of a, a warning signal telling me something is wrong with the car. But guess what? It's not in English, it's in, in Japanese. I've just got a, a battery sign with a cross. I hope nothing happens to the car while I'm using it. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know if something needs to be checked. Yeah, it's not in English. Why is it not in English? Motoring journalist Muhammad Mutasim says, the error I encountered could cost me more than just mere inconvenience. Well, I'm here to show you what to look out for in the process of uh, renting a car. For example, the dents here on the bonnet, right. um, the wall damage, uh, as well as uh, the damage on the Ooh. side. Wow, I didn't see that. The windows kind of, side mirror is a bit busted. That's right. Yeah, you mentioned the scratches on the wall. Why should I take note of that? So, these damages, uh, they are indicators of the damages on the car. So, for example, this particular car that we have yeah. here, there are damages on the side and they are consistent with the damages on the wall. And uh, if you don't report it, that will be fine. Mm. But if the person who rents the car after you decides to report it, uh, then you might be liable for damages. So yeah. it becomes my fault. Correct. Similar to how users report dirty vehicles, other noticeable faults and damages to the cars should also be reported by users via the app or live chat before and after taking over a shared car. So are these damages quite common? It's very common to see all these little dings and dents uh, or okay. even more major ones. What if I notice these damages only after I started my rental? I just call the hotline and explain that the car has some damages mm. and ask them how to proceed from there. When a fault is reported, car sharing companies use their back-end algorithm to identify the culprit. You could be given a warning, a fine, or in the worst case scenario, legal action taken against you for causing damage to the car. So it is in your best interest to identify all faults to the car before or during its rental period to avoid being liable for damages you did not cause. And I'm about to find out how car sharing can be a costly affair when this happens. I was braking but not in time and then I knocked into the back. The outcome is that I'm with Malcolm Chen, who certainly feels hard done by after this happened in the beginning of 2021. So Malcolm, you've asked me to meet you here because this is where the accident took place, right? Yeah, that's right. Tell me what happened. So it was February 2021. It was at night after the rain. Um, the road conditions were wet. I was on the far most uh, left lane, mm -hmm. so-called slower lane. I was driving down this road. While approaching the traffic light at this okay. junction, um, there was a white BMW in front of me. And then at amber light, it braked. I knocked onto them. It was my judgment error given that I was at the back. So this was the blue SG I drove. You can see the conditions. The front right oh, bumper okay. was um, hit. The windshield cracked. Two airbags were deployed and the front, the speedometer segment popped out and turned okay, the other okay. way. Wow, okay, that looks quite serious. I mean, I, ha I have to ask you, how, how fast were you going? It wasn't fast enough such that I suffered any fatal injury and okay. thankfully the family of five with three kids at the back unscathed okay, well, as well. Okay. I'm, I'm very thankful for that, yeah. Was his car barely damaged? It's just the back bumper and okay. he could drive off. He just said that the exhaust sounded a bit wonky, okay. but he could get it checked. Ask him how does he want to settle it. He said just let the insurance company settle. Yeah, I called the customer service for Blue yep. SG. 
um, given the fact that uh, I did not damage any public property and okay. no one was injured or hurt, uh, there was no need to call the police. Okay. This was as confirmed by the customer service officer. Okay. And, uh, and after you went back home, I mean, did you, uh, did you have to file a report with Blue SG? Did you have to follow up with them on anything? As per the law, within 24 hours, I need to go down to Blue SG's um, office okay. at UB to make a report. I went down the next day. The person in charge said, based on the assessment, I will get the first party and third party liability charge. Those charges amounted to a whopping 11,250 Singapore dollars. I did ask for a breakdown. In the end, I received a lawyer letter chasing for payment. Okay. I said fine, I paid. After which, um, still no breakdown. Every car sharing user is automatically covered by insurance once they book a car. When it's our own car, we usually top up the insurance so we don't have to pay any excess, which is an out-of-pocket fee before insurance kicks in. It's not the case for car sharing insurance. So in the event of an accident, car sharing drivers are still liable for this excess fee. Malcolm had to pay the excess twice, once for damage to his shared car and once more for damage to the car he knocked into. Excess fees can range from about 1,000 Singapore dollars to more than $10,000, depending on the age of the car sharing user and driving experience. Malcolm isn't the only one who's had a bad experience after getting into an accident driving a shared car. Several Talking Point viewers wrote in to warn about sky-high damage costs. I wrote in to the car sharing companies to find out about their high excess fees. Blue SG told us that the excess charges are determined based on the insurance companies they work with. The company added that they've since lowered their excess amounts by about 40% for both experienced and inexperienced drivers. Getgo pointed us towards their collision damage waiver that can be purchased at an additional cost of 5% of the total booking charge. It's an add-on that users can get to reduce their excess by half. It's similar to Tribecar's Tribe Shield plan, which reduces the financial burden of insurance excess to only $500 per party for just an additional $1.20 per hour. Meanwhile, I'm reaching the tail end of my week-long car sharing experiment. Another wet and rainy morning and I had a side change in schedule. I tried to go online to book a car, but I'm too late. They're all taken, probably because it's a, a rainy day as well. So now I'm waiting for my wife to give me a ride to work. Otherwise, I'm going to be really late. Despite inconveniences like this, the revenue of car sharing services in Singapore is expected to rise by almost 50% to hit more than 300 million Singapore dollars in four years, signalling its popularity as a transport option. Transport expert Pratik Bansil has been observing car sharing trends across the globe. I want to know what the future holds for car sharing in Singapore. Is there a future for car sharing here in Singapore? Okay, Stephen, so let's try to understand the economics of car sharing with the other travel mode through this graph. We have three lines on this plot. The red one is for the ride hailing service, where I assume the surcharge of 1.3 because these days we are getting these surge levels. The blue line is for the car ownership cost, mm. assuming the COE of $80,000 for a compact car. And the green line is the car sharing, which is a kind of a combination of the A to B service and the A to A service for the weekends. So if we look at this plot, we can see if a consumer is driving 500 kilometers per month, which is around, if you look at it, it's less than 20 kilometers per day. The cost of car sharing is slightly above $500 per month. But owning the car costs you $1,500. Wow, that's almost three times more. So if you're driving less than 20 kilometers per day... No point just, buying a car. Yeah, no point buying a car. Every Singaporeans generally travel around 1,500 kilometers oh. a month, those who own a car. So for them, certainly the car sharing is fairly economical. So now I think we look at the more extreme situation yeah. in terms of a travel. Someone who is, let's say, driving 100 kilometers a day or 3,000 kilometers a month, so if we look at this situation, we can see that owning a car actually wins the game. 
100 kilometers per day. Wow, I'm thinking even if I live in Changi and I travel to Tuas, that's about 30, 40 kilometers one way. Right. I would have to do that trip almost two and a half times. Exactly. So basically, it's the distance that yep. defines that whether car sharing is economical or viable. I guess it's a bit like the economies of scale. Right. The penetration of car sharing in Singapore is 7 to 8%. So 7 to 8% of the population is using car sharing. Right. But you will be surprised to hear that this is the highest across the globe at the national level in wow. terms of the user penetration. Across the globe, in yes. the world. Yes. So I think the, the game changer here is if we can sort that first mile and last mile connectivity yeah. problem, then I think the convenience aspect of the car sharing can be sorted. Let's okay. say every 0.5 kilometers, if we have a car sharing station, many of the potential car users might shift to just using the car sharing and not owning the car. If they can handle the potential issues like the maintenance of the cars, maybe the convenience, as well as uh, the insurance ambiguity. Mm. So I think if some of these issues can be handled, I guess the car sharing can become even more viable option in the future than it is now. So is car sharing worth my time and money? After using it for seven days, this is how it adds up. I spent $449 on car sharing this week. It includes all miscellaneous fees like parking and ERP. So it adds up to about $1,800 a month, which is just below the average cost of owning an entry-level car in Singapore. Which also means I really didn't save that much money. But I guess that's because I'm on the road quite a bit, traveling an average of 40 kilometers a day. Now, if you don't travel that much, then car sharing would make sense cost-wise. But for me, it failed miserably. Accessibility was a problem, not to mention parking, getting the cars when I need it. So I guess I'm just going to stick to my trusty car for now. 